This is obviously a lightly PG-13 panel, meaning everything below, please. So keep them not weird. It's sad that I have to say that. Uh, but yeah, this is, uh, so I'll go to you guys, you guys can ask your questions. And then, but before we begin, I'm gonna start off with uh, introductions. So, if, uh, oh, where are the microphones? I didn't, excuse me. I haven't done my job in a while. Okay, this is less embarrassing. Here we go. <laughs> There's microphones. Um, please introduce yourselves and uh, obviously start like, who you play in DBC, but also just like other characters you've done throughout your career. Because you guys, the best thing about voice actors is that you guys are multitudes of, of people and characters. And if we tried to get through your entire mythology, we'd be here all day. Um, so just like uh, who you did in DBC and a bunch of other characters. <laughs> Uh, well, I, uh, my name is Jerry Green. Hi. Um, I played a lot of N64 and GameCube games when DBZ was airing because I was a child. Of course. Um, <laughs> but um, I did uh, play one of the alternate universe Namekians in Super. Oh. And I also did the script adaptation for a superhero. Oh, oh I, didn't, I did not know that. Whoa. I broke the mics on the way up here. <laughs> Somehow I broke the mic. had a switch on it. <laughs> I gave Jared the only one with a switch. Just me and you talking. Check. Oh, this is slow. Can you hear me though? Yeah. Yeah. I got a little slide echo. And then some other characters after that. Well, uh, yeah, I'm probably best known for voicing Nappa. Uh, yeah! One, I think one of the four English actors because the original was Canadian actor and Michael Dobson, the ocean dove, right? You would watch Dragon Ball on TV after school in the 90s, that's when they saw it. Here, I'll give you a I'll Check. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, that was Michael Dobson, and then when Funimation got the license and started doing Dragon Ball, I believe when they were on Toonami, originally Chris Sabat was doing the voice of Nappa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he was doing like half the voices because they were just trying to get them out. They were on deadlines and everything. Uh, then around early 2000s, when they said, okay, we're going to put them on Cartoon Network, we're going to make we're going to get organized. That's when I was cast as Napa. Uh, and I count Takahata 101 from DBZ Abridged as a legitimate Napa. So to me, to me, I'm one of four Napas. We're really a just as famous Napa. <laughs> I, but I, I've probably done it the most because, so from then on, I was in, when they dubbed uh, Z again, we did Kai, all the video games, it's always been me. So. Uh, besides that, I did, I did a lot of other loud, dumb characters like Jesus Burgess in One Piece. Uh, some loud, brutish, smarter characters like Buccaneer in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Uh, some loud, sneakier, more dangerous characters like Kenny Ackerman in Attack on Titan. Um, some loud, heroic characters like Captain Burns in Fire Force. Okay. Uh, you were Captain Burns in Fire Force? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if season three ever comes out, I'll return to the role. I know, right? Uh, and um, I'm current, I just finished doing the first season of Hell's Paradise. I don't know if anyone's been watching that on the stream. So, yeah. I'm waiting on uh, Which is connected in the Dark Trio to Jujutsu Kaisen and Chainsaw Man. It's part of that family of manga. Anyway, the character called Intensu Sai, who's also big and loud and but a little smarter. Sorry, now I'm starting to see a trend here. <laughs> I've been cast often as these big brutish guys, yeah. So. There you go. Uh, let's see, okay, so Dragon Ball-wise, uh, in the Dragon Ball universe, I played Turles, 
in the movie Tree of Might, and he's also in like 12 of the video games. Uh, I played two characters in, in Kai that I can't remember. One of them was named Orlin, the other one I don't remember. I have no idea. Uh, apart from uh, Dragon Ball, I, I guess I've known him for Greed and Full Metal Alchemist and Full Metal Alchemist. Oh my gosh, I forgot you are Greed. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Oikawa in Haikyuu and um, uh, uh, Fire at Fire Emblem Three Houses, I play Linhart. Uh, also, in upcoming stuff, I'm playing um, a really sweet vampire like you do, named Fargrave in Farming Life in Another World. And I'm in the upcoming season of Don Manchi um, as a character I can't name yet. So that's hmm. going on. Nice, and so now they're getting another sure, season. Like you didn't is it wrong to pick up a girl in a you dungeon? Know, one of my favorite characters of all time is something you play. So, uh, tell us. Okay, let's see. Um, is this on? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, Shitsu is yes. my hero. That one. <laughs> <laughs> that one. And let's see, there's uh, Rock and Nanbaka, Cobra and Fairy Tail. Oh, you're Cobra and Fairy Tail? Mm. I forgot that. Ah, yep. oh, that's awesome. And Fukuboshi in One Piece, and a lot of, like, you know, I had to look it up. Evil dudes who get stabbed in the throat or whatever, and all kinds of different things. I feel like we all can say that. <laughs> That's half of the voice acting work is just getting stabbed. That's you. You, you laugh. It is. <laughs> it is. Or smashed, or shot. I, we all die a thousand deaths in the booth. There was one show where I got stepped on by a big turtle. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. What is your weirdest thing you had to emulate its death? Like, what is the weirdest death you've had on screen so far? Mine was I was thrown into helicopter blades. Like, and I knew something horrible was about to happen to him because it's a non-named character having this awkward scene. My wife is going to see, like, he's saying all these really hard words. like, oh, he's going to die violently. He's not going to have a good, and then he gets thrown into helicopter blades. <laughs> but so your is yours getting stepped on by a turtle? Uh, this one would probably be the one that, you know, came fairly close to actually killing me in real life when I did it. Um, it was a show called King's Game, the Animation. Mm. Um, and at the end of the first episode, there's this, uh, you know, I, I got to be the tone-setting death. Um, and I basically just, like, it's sort of like every blood vessel in my body exploded at the same time. Uh, and so it was just like this very squishy, gurgly sounding, like hyper constricted thing that um, actually made me pass out after the first take. I would have loved that to have been that engineer. Oh, oh yeah, no, it was a. It was actually Tabitha Ray's first night directing. <laughs> first time directing, I killed someone. <laughs> And she's so sweet, I can see her not being able to deal with that. Yeah, no, it was, they, they thought I was joking around and then I stood up and walked out of the booth and they're like, wait, was that real? And I'm like, yeah, I was unconscious. <laughs> what about you, Phil? Weirdest death? Uh, the only thing that springs to mind is getting ripped in half. You know, like the torso going one way, the legs going the other way. I don't remember what show it was in. But it was the same sound as getting sliced. You know, there's yeah, as you can do. Yeah. And it's yeah. a surprisingly common thing that happens, especially yeah. in Attack on Titan. Right. I would say that's the most common death in Attack on Titan. Oh, uh, I would say doing Kenny Ackerman's death was the most poignant. He has a long speech, and there's a lot of gurgling, and yeah, but he says it's a lot of profound things. Things. Uh, profound things that I still write on pop figures to this day. So. And you, Chris, what was your weirdest death up to this point? I don't know if it was weird. It was pretty epic, though. When uh, It's the second, well... Uh, when Greed dies in Brotherhood, spoiler alert, you've had 18 years, but uh, when Greed dies in Brotherhood, like in the fire pit, he gives like a sort of epic, almost Shakespearean speech as he's about to be burned alive, and, it, it, and it's basically he's giving just a big middle finger to everyone uh, while as he's dying. What a, way, what a way to go out, what a queen, honestly. I mean, I see, yeah. Dude, that's the coolest character in that show, at least like top five. Yeah. And so you just got this, ah, uh, yeah, it, that was a good death. It's probably one of the greatest death scenes. It's an epic death. It's an epic death scene. Yes. Um, so yeah, so, uh, uh, again, it's like, you guys have such long histories. And so one of the common questions we get asked is like, how do you get started in voice acting? So I'm going to just go ahead and burn that right now. How do, you get to, how do you become a voice actor? There is no answer to it. 
And I'm not saying that as a way of killing your dreams. It really doesn't have an answer. Because we can tell you exactly how each one of them did it. You can try to recreate it, and it would not work for you. And then we can tell you everything not to do. Like, don't do any of these things. And then you would go and do them, and it would work for you. There's no rhyme or reason to this industry whatsoever. It is a giant ball of chaos. So the only, the only thing that is resounding to it all is just be an actor, pursue acting, and then stuff happens. Just do it long enough that people know you do it. That's it. But, but, this, this job is weird. And so, by that, it's like sometimes you come to acting in a lot of weird ways. What is, like, in, uh, just briefly, what is your acting origin story? How did it come to be? Like, how did it come to be? Well, <laughs> um, I did theater in high school, like, as kind of a, like, Kind of at my mom's suggestion, way to get out of my shell, and it, it helped. I enjoyed it. Um, she was worried about your N64 addiction. <laughs> <laughs> it was a part of a 12-step program to break his N64 addiction. Well, this was in the GameCube days. By that point, I'd progressed. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's harder stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, sort of fell out of it in college, but got into filmmaking. Uh, then. Uh, met someone at the college radio station who ended up hiring me for unrelated things at Funimation and got into the open auditions at Funny and then they started casting me and stuff. See? And you couldn't recreate that story because you can't start with like, well, there's no way of creating an N64 addiction. <laughs> so, like, see? What about you, Bill? How did you get started on all this? Oh, well, like Jared, I, I did theater in high school, though it was long before Jared did theater in high school because I was not a middle schooler when the N64 was out. I was playing it all the time, just as a loser adult. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, I dropped out of college, and, I, and then I started doing, I didn't go to college for any kind of theater, but when I dropped out, I started doing community theater, did a few shows. Then I auditioned for what I thought was a play in Dallas where I lived, and it was actually a comedy troupe. And they're like, oh no, we're going to do improv, and we're going to write sketches, and, and we're going to make all this shit up, and then, excuse me, uh, and then go on stage in, in a few weeks, which is terrifying. I've never done improv or, you know, written sketches. Uh, no, but the same era. It was uh, called the Wawa Bobblets at the time. Anyway, so, uh, and I discovered, hey, I like this a lot better than doing theater, and it pays, not much, but it paid, and you you know, you get to create, and then I stayed with the troupe for years, and wrote, and directed. The problem with having a comedy troupe is it's good when you're young, and or somebody has a lot of money, so they can make it a business where you're all paid. Otherwise, as people get older, they have, just like a band, they have jobs, they have families, and they, they it becomes a hobby, and then you can't really get things going. So, I did whatever I could in small time showbiz to make a living. You know, I taught comedy defensive driving for years, did a little bit of stand-up, did a lot of murder mystery dinner shows, just anything that paid. I got into doing impersonations, uh, which was the most lucrative thing I had, where I would uh, full on impersonate Austin Powers or a political figure, somebody and do corporate events and parties. And around that time is when somebody I knew from working said, oh, my neighbor runs this voiceover studio. It's called Funimation. Uh, they're having auditions. And so I wasn't looking to be a voice actor, but I thought, well, that sounds cool. And I got cast in the first thing I auditioned for, and they kept using me. And But it was not what I was looking to make my living with, it was just, it was cool to be in cartoons. You know, my real money was made doing the Austin Powers and all that stuff. Um, but That's now... That's a strange statement. <laughs> <laughs> I was making real money being Austin Powers. It really was. I had, I had those damn teeth in like five, six times a week at one point. Like, there were several strange statements throughout the course of that, one of which being comedy defensive driving. <laughs> we, I could have a whole hour just you explaining what the heck that means. You never had to take defensive driving for a ticket? I did, was it wasn't funny. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, this company, they started in California, the improv used to do it, and then these two guys in Texas started it. And it was, a, it was really successful, because back then, the only way to, to get out of a ticket is either pay it, get a lawyer, or you could take driving. Uh, and you couldn't do it online or in a machine. You, know, you had to go into a classroom to do it. And people were starved for it to be more entertaining. So they, they got, they recruited professional comedians or people from comedy troops. And so you had to do the real, you had to get state certified, TEA, all that stuff, but you were trying to make it as fun and funny as you could. I just love the idea of like, so, hitting old ladies with cars, huh? Just like, like trying to break the ice. Like, 
Uh, so Chris, your origin story. Huh. Uh, at nine years old, I started uh, performing with the actually children's chorus of the Houston Grand Opera. Um, and then I got, from that I went into musical theater and theater and improv and all that. Then in my high school years, I quit acting to be a club kid for four years. And that's a whole uh, book worth of stuff I can't talk about in front of a panel like this. We need and a higher rating panel. <laughs> College, I got back into, I became a theater major, and I went to U of H with Monica Rial and Jim Parsons and a whole bunch of other people that we, all, we were all like in college together. And I was like, well, I'm gonna be a Broadway guy, I'm gonna go to New York, and blah, blah, blah. And I was doing a show in Houston, here in Houston, and a girl named Jessica Calvello, who you might, or might not know as a very prolific voice actor, um, she was like, you should go audition for this company in town. Uh, they're called ADD Films, and they dub Japanese animation into English, and I'm like, what? Really? What? And she was like, yeah. And I auditioned, and same thing, like, they, like, snapped me up, and they liked me, and I started doing a lot of work for them. That led to work with Funimation, and, um, yeah, and then here, here we are in 2023. Yeah. That's it. And, yeah, and it's like, and obviously at that time, nobody knew what it was going to be. Like, nobody knew what, where we would be right now. And especially being a part of, like, probably what I would consider the quintessential anime, which is DBZ, like that is, if anime is synonymous with DBZ. And so, like, is it weird being a part of something as, as internationally massive to the point, it's almost like, it's almost like a collective culture, like, it is synonymous with the world, like, the world is So, yeah, and I will say, when I was living in, I was living in Maryland for a while, and, uh, by virtue of living that close to New York, I ended up being in Pokemon as well. So now it's really interesting because if, if someone who doesn't really know anime, and you're trying to explain what you do, and you're like, well, I, I voice anime and video games and, and audiobooks, and they're like, what? Anime? Like, what? what do you, I'm like, well, have you heard of. They're like, well, I've heard of Pokemon and Dragon Ball Z. I'm like, yes! Uh huh, yes. Both of those. Wow, yes. you were my entire childhood. Wow. <laughs> Also, Full Metal Alchemist. Those are usually the three. The, the, the big yeah. three. Uh, well, Sailor Moon, I think, would also be. Oh, God, of course. Yeah, like, I think Sailor Moon kind of forces full FMA out. <laughs> yeah, it's, Sailor Moon is. Like, everyone knows Sailor Moon. It's just I'm not in that much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where's Lauren Landon? And, Bill, I think this is, like, really also, like, because somehow, like, you're probably one of the most iconic characters in the whole show. Due to like circumstances beyond even DBZ's control, because like Napa was like kind of an inconsequential character almost, because like he's kind of a part of a meme, which is the over nine thousand. But then he like was resurrected and became like this whole thing because of like uh, Taka and all them. Oh, totally, yeah. Those guys, I I attribute Napa's popularity to those guys. They definitely kept him alive. Or at least as a ghost. <laughs> and he used him in a very comedic way. I thought it was brilliant. Uh, yeah, I mean, for a guy who's only in part of the first season, you know, I'm the Tasha Yar. You know, yeah, yeah. Dragon Ball. But, uh, you know, Denise Crosby still does conventions. So. Yeah. And, but yeah, I, it's funny. I, I didn't, I was totally unaware of how big Dragon Ball was when I was doing it. Um, I always like to tell this story. E even the, even the 9,000 meme, I was totally oblivious to. When we dubbed Kai, this is like 2008-ish, so that meme had already been around. And did you guys watch Kai? You wanna watch the Kai dub? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they, they switched it back to the manga of 8,000, right? So we were recording the line, and Sapphire was directing, and he wanted to get a, a take that sort of made fun of the meme. So I did the line, you know, the, the response to the power level, and he's like, okay, let's get another one. But this time go really over the top. But I didn't know we were making fun of him. I thought he just wanted a bigger read, so I kept doing it for him. I was like, no, no, I need it. I need it much bigger. You know, <laughs> the hell is Sabbath doing? You know, so I'm like, oh, we're You know, I was like, we're getting there. We're, we're close. <laughs> is he trying it's to kill his franchise? Good, you know, it's also a really good Sabbath. <laughs> it's a really good Sabbath. Well, I always, every I always think if you ever live an interview with somebody that's ever done Saturday Night Live, every SNL veteran has a Lauren Michaels impression. And I think every Funimation actor, at least the old school ones, have a Sabbath impression. Yeah. Right, Jared? I mean, I, I barely know Sabbath. 
<laughs> He's like, I'm too scared to. Because <laughs> I am too. Actually, I was like, one of my questions I had canned for you guys was what's, uh, like this job has a way of being embarrassing and it's a Sabbath, my, my embarrassing story was gonna be a Sabbath story where I had to do an impression of him to his face <laughs> because one of my friends thought it would be funny. <laughs> In the middle of a convention, it was the most mortifying thing ever that's ever happened I hated it. Um, but yeah, and, 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 then, and then there's like a second part of this for you, Phil, which is that all of, what was it like Whenever, so you obviously didn't know that uh, Team Four Star was doing something, and then I assume at some point while you're doing conventions or like some part in your career, people just started yelling at you lines that never existed, like "Vegeta, it's a chow suit," like so. Like, did that happen for you? Well, by then, by time I started, I don't really start doing conventions regularly, like six, seven months ago, but I knew about it by then. So you knew, but, it. but I was surprised by how many times they wanted like you know, a, a print or a pop figure or something signed with lines from DBZ, and they're usually very trepidatious. They're like, oh, I don't want to offend you, but uh, are you are you cool with the, the Dragon Ball Z abridged? You know, they're afraid I'm gonna, it's like, no, those assholes, they don't, you know. I'm like, yeah, it's great, what do you want to sign? You know, I, I have no problem with it, but I guess some, maybe some actors have had issues with them, so. Uh, Gina. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You actually probably have one of one of the toughest positions is that you had to write this. Like you had to write like and by the time you're writing it, it is this international phenomenon. Like and what was that experience like? Super uh, well this was specifically a, a superhero movie and it was you know, it was kind of its own thing because like by the nature of it, it's sort of straight away from all of the meme content. Like it was really a big, it was really a big throwback to the original Dragon Ball. And so, like it was, like you know, I took obviously I grew up watching the dub, and so like the tone of it sort of came from there. And like I know Sabbath uh, uh, sprinkled a little bit more of that in the mix uh, in the booth when he was directing it. Um, but like, yeah, it was still like, it's a bunch of pressure knowing that I'm dealing with something that means so much to so many people and it was, you know, kind of a relief to be able to go like, well, they didn't delve into any of that too much, so neither am I. Neither am I. And it must, that must be also kind of, uh, you know, uh, relieving because it's like, you're getting to do the version that you grew up with, like the version you were familiar with. So you got to harken back that so there's none of this, like other stuff that you're having to like pay pay honor yeah. to, like you just got to write the version that you fell in love with, that you the, that's super cool. I'm very jealous, and you got to write a lot of cool stuff. Like I think every panel I've done with you, uh, I'm discovering like another cool thing that you've written. I'm like, it's a much bigger deal than I initially anticipated. It's a little, it's making me uncomfortable. <laughs> so that's awesome. So before we get into the questions that you guys have, I have one last question, which is that. In this world of acting, uh, part of our job is to bridge the gap between what the director wants and what we're doing. That's our job. It's that communication. We're the artists, we're, the, we're creating, and they're creating, and then we bridge the gap between the two. But every so often, we get really weird directions. Super weird directions that have no interpretation whatsoever. Uh, what is the weirdest direction you've ever gotten? <laughs> Mine, my favorite, so just so I can buy you time to think, my favorite of all time, and it's not that it's weird, it was just how dumb it was, which was, and it wasn't even to me, it wasn't even to me, it was to another actress, and we're on set, and, uh, and the director comes up and he's like, okay, so here's the deal, here's, here's what I need. I just need you to pretend that it's real. I was like, that's kind of what acting is. <laughs> and like, you saw every actor on set go, <laughs> And, he, and, and we were all trying hard not to, because he's the director, he could, we could get fired, but we're all like... <laughs> and so like, for the rest of the day, it was like, hey, excuse me, I need you to pretend that it's real. <laughs> and we did, we've done this for a decade now. Every time we see each other on any other set, we're like, hey, um, I, I, I saw what you did, great. I need you to pretend that it's real. <laughs> so, well, what are some more directions you've got, either in the booth or another project? Um. Yeah, there's something that stands out. Uh, so, if any of you know, this is like older school reference, but um, we'll, we'll still get there, uh, even if you don't know what I'm talking about. There's a director named Stephen Foster. 
um, from the old ADD days. And he is responsible for a little dub called Ghost Stories that... Oh my god! So, he's this um, scrawny, uh, little, bald-headed, super gay man, and he's really funny, and he gives very odd direction. Uh, I was working on a show for him called S Otherwise, and um, my character was having to sort of wax poetic about something, and, and Steven was trying to get me to a place that I guess I wasn't feeling that day, or whatever. He was, I, was, I still don't know what this meant, but I, I, I got the line right for his sake after he said it. So, um, he's like, oh, Pat, you know what? I just need that to be a little bit more lesbian cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, word, okay, let me, let, me, let me process that for a second. And then I did the line, he's like, that's it. And I was like, cool, all right. I need you to tell me what dub that was so I can go find out what lesbian cheesecake sounds like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, need a, I need a show and an episode. Yes. And I'm just gonna see if I can check out lesbian cheesecake. What about you, Bill? Some weird directions. I was trying to think of one. Uh, I think I did it. I think Sabbath told me to keep screaming 8,000 miles over, but I had no idea why. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> You do it you got? I'm thinking of, I think it was on Tokyo Ravens, maybe? Um, it was one of the first shows I worked with Colleen on, and my character in that is like this, like, white-haired, roguish, not sort of, not quite a villain, but like a dickhead anti-hero, and um, I think I was, there was some scene where I was threatening the main heroine and I, you know, give her a take and she's like, okay, I like that it was kind of like weirdly sexual like that. Now, and I'm like, wait, it was. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it was. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I like it when it, that's like a reverse direction where it's like, I wasn't intending it to be that. <laughs> so Jared's just naturally weirdly sexual. <laughs> Like, I, can only, I can only hit on somebody when I don't mean to. <laughs> it's a problem, man. What are some questions?